Thank you, praise and worship team. Oh, my. Jesus is alive, king of my heart. Jesus paid it all. Faith and wonder, is there anything? Jesus, only Jesus. Thank you, thank you, worship team, instruments, voices. Thank you, church, for jumping in. They are not leading as much as they, as a part of this worship, are maybe instigating something in the word and the spirit by saying we're not going to forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. We're going to get together and have a sweet time worshiping the Lord. So thank you. Thank you, Lord, and uh, praise ye the Lord. Back to Ecclesiastes this morning. Um, you were uh, blessed to not have me preaching to you the last two Sundays. A couple Sundays ago, short message. Short ones sometimes work. You know, I'm a little extra inspired this morning. So we'll, uh, we'll have a neat time in Ecclesiastes 8. We're back to our study called Search for Purpose in Everything. I wonder how many of you, and this is not a class participation question, just something to... I wonder how many of you have been reading this, this book a little bit, studying it on your own, Ecclesiastes, as all the other 65 books have, has so much depth and so much truth for you to chew on. Some of it is from the perspective of a man who is bewildered. He is uh, kind of messy. He's having a tough time in his season of life. It's near the end of his life. And so if some of his statements, you go, what is that all about? That doesn't sound like a God statement. It's in his word, God's word. He authored it by the Holy Spirit, and he has it there for a reason, for you to think it through, for you to search for purpose in everything and have you consider what really it can be like in your life when you are the wisest man on the face of the earth and then fall away from God. And then get to a place where, as we know in the scriptures, Job was looked at as the most righteous man. But before God, he was a sinner just like you and me. And it was brought clear out in that study on Job and the account of his life with his friends. How this righteous man still clearly had some difficulties. And it was called sin. Here's this man, Solomon, wisest man, richest man. Don't believe me, we'll find it in the Bible. I'm declaring the things that are spoken of in the word of God. And yet, as the wisest man in the world at that time, the Bible says before or after that, and he wrote some of the most powerful wisdom statements that you're ever going to read his love relationship, as we mentioned, in the Song of Solomon with God. It's beautiful to picture our relationship we ought to have with the Lord Jesus Christ. The relationship that the church, the bride, should have with the Lord. And that beautiful, beautiful love letter that he wrote, that poem in Song of Solomon. And yet, at his life's end here, we find out that the wisest man is actually as much a fool as any of us can be. From the righteous who realize that they're a sinner... Like you and me, from the wisest that God declares the wisest to someone who's as foolish as they could possibly be, it is clear that the human condition in our state needs to be a little bit better. That's found in Jesus Christ, who we just spoke about. We need to have a clearer thought, a clearer vision of the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll cover that in our men's conference and refine our vision of him. How do we see Jesus Christ high and lifted up? And we need to have a stronger faith. We need to be in that place where as we read what happened to Solomon's life in the accounting in Ecclesiastes, the preacher speaking, as we know in chapter number one in the very beginning, he's speaking to quite a crowd, the nation of Israel, He's speaking to a bunch of people who need to hear the truth, and yet he's speaking this stuff of the way he sees vanity, vexation of spirit. Oh, life is so difficult. Oh, I don't know if I can just live it through. Well, that's reality for many of us. 
to realize there's so much in life that we should have done something about, we should have changed or asked God to change us, and oftentimes we don't do so. We don't search things out. Our theme verse found in chapter number 1, verse 13 says, I gave my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom concerning all things that are done under heaven. Think again. I gave my heart. When you put your heart into something, it's got to be pretty important. And he says, I gave my heart. Solomon said, I gave my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom concerning all things that are done under heaven. Again, he's declaring something very important. Don't miss it. Under heaven. Not eternally thinking. Under the sun. Thinking temporally on this terrestrial place that we've been put on. And he says, hey, guess what? In the second part of the verse, it's sore travail. God put upon us, given to the sons of man to be exercised with, therewith. I love the illustration in the preaching message about the hardness and the uh, uh, stony hardness of the heart and what it can become because then it possibly could be broken by God. People say, well, I don't know if I should pray for that hardness or pray for that. But if someone's heart and soul gets so hard, all that's left is for that hardness to break one day. And that the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ would break that heart. And here we are, God saying, hey, I did put things on this earth that are really messy and hard to figure out. Without me, it will be sore to <laughs> But with me... And my son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the truth of my principles and my knowledge, understanding, and wisdom, it wouldn't be so sore. But again, Solomon is making a declarative statement of what it's like to seek and to search out things by your heart, and they're all under the sun and under heaven. It is a tough thing if you leave the Lord Jesus Christ out. In fact, many of the things in our lives, I think, we get to a place where we just go, ah, nothing I can do about it. Ah, who cares? The things of God we should do something about. Boy, I've got some things in my life that are really kind of messy. I need to get closer to God. Well, you could do something about that. Don't be so like, ah, well, maybe it'll get better one day. I guess. Maybe if I hear just here one good preaching message one of these days, if I get one good lesson in investors, maybe if I could just, somebody could just speak to me something good, then maybe it'll get better, maybe possibly, uh, and you kick that can right down the road and go, maybe. You become passive over that. But then the things of the Lord Jesus Christ, you say, wait a minute, I'm not supposed to be passive over that. I'm not supposed to say, okay. Ah, I don't care. Ah, I can't do anything about it. In fact, there's some things about our walk with the Lord Jesus Christ that we unfortunately treat passively and we ought not. That's the way Solomon got in his life. Thus, the title of our message today, we ought to reject passivity. There is a study that's been around for a number of years. It was authored by Robert Lewis, of course, in conjunction with the Lord Jesus Christ and the teachings of Christ. Robert Lewis is a pastor for many, many years, a founder of Men's Fraternity. And in this study in Men's Fraternity, he came up with something years ago. And it stated simply this, that we can learn from Jesus and from the teaching, from the scriptures, and from what the layout is, that there are four characteristics that really a man ought to have in learning from Jesus. Many, 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 of course, but these four he brought it into. The first one was to reject passivity. Be someone who rejects passivity in the matters that are important to God, the matters that are important to your faith, in your walk, in the gospel, in the mission. I mean, the last two Sundays we had great speaking on international missions. Randy did a tremendous job. Our pastor over missions conveyed to you all that we do and all that we're part of, what God, most of all, has given us great grace on to be in on with many, many missionaries, over 30 of them, that you can pray on Sunday mornings at 8 a.m., that you can go by praying, go by giving, that you can go by going, that you can go on a mission trip, an international trip. And so that was a tremendous accounting. Well, I'm just going to kick that thing down the, down the road. That's being passive. 
That's saying, I really don't care if I go or not. Really? Really? You don't care? Of course we don't care about a lot of things. Let's just be straight up and honest with ourselves. We don't care about a lot of things of God, yet we want things to be better with God. We end up becoming passive. We need to reject the passivity, even in our view of being an Acts 1-8 church and the gospel mission and missions. And you think about it, a couple weeks ago, and our regional mission speaking, Atlanta was speaking on all of that. The gospel message going out in God's kingdom work with some people of faith at these different centers wanting to save babies' lives and then see salvations and people's souls being saved and being on the front lines of all that and having over 3,000 gospel conversations over the course of a year. I mean, ah, that's nice for them. Ah, the baby bottle drive. What are they going to do with all those pennies, nickels, and dimes? Well, get your bottles in today, and we'll give you a report later as what Lana did for you. She gave you a report on the incredible work going on in the mission of Resource health. Ah, ah, nothing I can do about that. Ah, you and I have to get to a point where the things of God are not in a place of passivity for us. We are to reject passivity because, as in that study I mentioned, that's one of them. The other three are expect God's greater reward, accept responsibility, and lead courageously. That's a part of a men's study. Because being passive very simply says this. I tend not to take an active or lead part in something. If I'm a passive-aggressive person, I'm the type of person in my behavior and personality that I indirectly resist the demands of others that are in authority. And I avoid confrontation. You see, there's a lot of stuff going on in the world of your life. There's a lot of stuff in the Bible that will apply and put into you to be able to not be passive over things. And to reject passivity and say, ah, somebody else has got to take care of that. You see, the only thing necessary, as the quote goes, for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. You've heard that before. Let me repeat it. The only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. I preached a few weeks ago about right is better than good. Why? That's one of them. Because there's a lot of good men around that aren't doing a thing that is right for God. Oh, he's a good old boy. He's a good old guy. He's a great woman. She's a, she's a great gal. She's the best. She, she does it. Well, may I ask how you became so passive over the matters that mean so much to Jesus Christ, the souls of people that he died for? How is it that we forget that the human condition has a propensity to find evil things to be active in? The human condition... You and I, in our frailty, <coughs> in our place of life, absent from God, absent from the life, change, and redemption of the Lord Jesus Christ, that's who you sung about, Jesus. Jesus is the one who's given you a new life and has changed your human condition to where you can, by the Spirit and by the Word, live a life that's fulfilling, but in your human condition, under the sun, under heaven, you and I have a propensity to find evil. People can find evil. You give them a little bit of time. I've shared this before. In youth work, we used to always say that it was three people that you are. The person you are at home, the person you are at school, and the person that you are at church and around the youth group. And a seven year old, seventh grader once said to me, Brownie, you're forgetting one person. Who is that? It's the person that you are when you're all by yourself. That came out of the mouth of a 12-year-old that I had an opportunity to lead to the Lord the year before. What an honor and privilege that young man saying that just shocked me. I said, duh, no, like, uh, no. Because the human condition puts me in a place where I have a propensity to do something evil. I can think evil. I can have evil thoughts. I, 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 whoa. In my flesh dwelleth no good thing. I was talking to Bobby about that this week. Because the older we get and all the people, the old preachers that we were told, ah, when you get older, you have no idea the battle that you're going to have in your spirit to be able to really walk closer to the Lord. Ah, gosh, when you get older, it's going to get easier. 
<laughs> the longer you are in the Lord and the longer you are in this walk of faith, you realize that there's many things that still draw you away. Many things that now you're aware of where maybe you just did become passive over it. You see, from our last sermon a few weeks ago in chapter number 7, the last verse said this. Lo, this only have I found, that God hath made man upright. Okay, good start, man. But they have sought out many inventions. If you study inventions a little bit, you'll realize that even our author, Solomon, who writes this, who this is spoken of, you say, okay, where do you get that from? Well, the Bible clearly says in Proverbs 8, I, wisdom, personally speaking of the person of wisdom, the Lord, dwell with prudence and find out knowledge of witty inventions. Now, what kind of wisdom would end up go to witty inventions? Oh, inventions are great. We have so many things that make life so much easier. Well, do they? Because the concordance says witty inventions means a plan usually evil, sometimes good, but sometimes a wicked device with an intent for mischievousness. Inventions are good, but are they? You see, the text of this and the context is saying, hey, there's people that start out really, really well. They come up with some kind of inventions on how to do things with their time, their money, their energies, and all of a sudden, they don't go with giving. They're too busy. They don't go with going. And we don't go with praying. Being an Acts 1 8 church is just too tough. See? The only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. There's a lot of good men in the Lord that are doing nothing. There's a lot of good people that have decided that doing the right thing is okay at certain times. But I'm a good person. And I thank the Lord for my redemption. And I thank him for this good life that I have. Well, at that point, you ought to ask yourself, are you really active in the things of this world and passive in the things of God? See, this theme continues to reoccur throughout the book of Ecclesiastes. I'm just rewording it a little bit, but that's the summation of what Solomon's constantly saying. This world, vanity, vexation of spirit, oh, it's futile, it's a mess. Yes, apart from God. Apart from the Lord Jesus Christ, eat, drink, and be merry. By the way, we'll get to that here in a little bit. It's found in the Bible. Where do the worldly people with all their worldly wisdom get their worldly statements? They get them from God's wisdom that they rehearse and repackage. Are we active in the things of this world and passive in the things of God? I think that happened to Solomon. In fact, Solomon got really busy working on the things of this world. What are you busy on? Right now, what are you thinking about? Things of God or things of this world? Right now. See, we are active in something. We need to reject the passivity that we have toward the things that are important to God because we know of King Solomon. King Solomon, you know what? You need to consider this. <clears throat> he enabled his wicked nature. He enabled, he gave permission to his wicked nature with a passive approach of guarding his heart. He had a passive approach. I don't care. There's nothing I can do about this flesh. Oh, really? That's one of my greatest battles in the spirit. If you don't understand Romans chapter number seven by now, believer, go read it today. That's your homework. The things that I would do, I would not. I do not. And the things that I do not, that I, I would not, I do. I am so conflicted so many times. Read Romans six as a great foundation for it. And then when you really get into it, read Romans eight. 
6, 7, and 8. And you get the foundation of how it ought to be in our walk and spiritually being circumcised by his grace through faith to live a life that's so pleasing to him. If you're lost today, you don't even know what I'm talking about. You need to be born again so you understand the beautiful wrestling match of obeying Jesus or obeying your flesh. And when you choose to obey Jesus, there's nothing sweeter. It is beautiful. And King Solomon knew what it was like to obey God. He started out so well, but yet then he enabled his wicked nature with passivity about guarding his heart. How do I know that? Because it's in 1 Kings chapter number 11. I have it up on the screen for you. I'll read these couple of verses and then we'll get into our Sunday morning study in Ecclesiastes 8. 1 Kings 11, 4 through 6 say this. We've reviewed these when we started out the series a few months ago. For it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods. And his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. Pause. I want you to just stare at that for a minute. And after staring at it, don't be passive. I want it to sink in and be active in the spirit by the word. Come on now. You know what that's saying right there? David's heart was perfect. Who made it perfect? Oh, I'm not perfect. Careful. We're not talking about sinlessness. We're talking about how. I'm a new creature in Christ. Old things passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Paul says, I pray that Christ dwell in your hearts in Ephesians 3. David, it says, had a perfect heart, and Solomon's was not perfect with the Lord his God as was the heart of David, his father, that means his relationship by God, not by his works, but by his faith, which God then counted righteous by his grace through faith, as the Old Testament teaches us, just like Abraham in Romans 3 and 4. The heart was not perfect Solomon's was not with the Lord, but the heart of David, his father, was because God made it that way in his relationship. The Holy Spirit dwells in you, believer. If you're lost today, another incredible benefit. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. For the wages of sin is death, his gift to God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Why? So that for by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man to boast. Solomon knew all of this truth because he was God's anointed king by David in lineage. He gave him a great challenge. And yet Solomon's heart in, a, in a First Kings chapter number 11 was not perfect. That was free of charge. It didn't cost you anything. What it does cost us is a look in our hearts in an active way instead of a passive way. For Solomon went after Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Zidians, and after the Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites, these false gods that were evil and wicked, sacrificing children, the wickedness that he was after. And it says in verse number 6, And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord and went not fully after the Lord, as did David his father. Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord because... He never guarded his heart actively. He took a passive approach like so many of us do and go, ah, I can handle that. I can be okay with that. And then we have the accounting in Ecclesiastes where Solomon was not okay. He really wasn't okay. Maybe some of you this morning aren't okay in your relationship with God. Praise the Lord that you would say that and think that and the Spirit of God's revealing that. Then it's time maybe to sit down with someone. Our office is open. We have five pastors, six pastors on staff. They would love to minister unto you. I'll sit down with you anytime. I'll go anywhere. As long as there's coffee. No, just kidding. 
Ice cream is good too. You think I got so skinny by eating, just drinking coffee? Anywhere, anyhow, I know Dwayne would do the same. Bobby, Brian, Coach, Josh, whomever. Or call up someone who you know is just so sound in the Word of God. Call up someone who disciples other people. You got questions, Art? Give him a call. If he doesn't know anything, I mean, no, he knows everything. That's right. That's what we do. You want to learn the Word of God and know what it takes to not be in a place where you are right now, maybe. And say, I need some direction, some guidance, because I could end up like Solomon here. In fact, I'm just one foot on a banana peel and the other foot in the grave, ready to slip right into a major, major mess. Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord. That's not the way his ministry started. It didn't start that way. And as we go through chapter 8, we'll hit 9, 10, 11, 12, of course. You didn't know I was good with math, did you? They're after 8. So when we start hitting those chapters, you find out that he starts mentioning God a little bit. But still, it's not that personal re relationship like it ought to be. But he just mentions the God that he knows of. You see, we need to reject passivity in our walk with the Lord. We need to reject passivity when it comes to the evil wickedness of this world and how it's affecting our children, our grandchildren, our next generation. It's affecting all of you. And we need to reject the passivity that we have, the passive approach to things. All it means is that you'll accept whatever happens without active response or resistance. The perceived passivity of the populace is deceptive. People just go, oh, whatever. Then you and I end up in a place like Solomon. Well, God will take care of us and everything will be fine. And I'll get out of here and I'll be in heaven. Hallelujah. In the meantime, what about all the lost people that are in your life that do not know Jesus Christ? How about your children? Your grandchildren? Some of you. How about some of the younger people in here that don't know how to go out or come in just like you and me? How about somebody, there's some people trying to raise children right now. Hey, 40s, 50s, and 60s, let's go. We need you. The church needs you to teach them how to reject passivity in their walk. To know that they can get after it. They can walk with the Lord. When they fall down, Jesus will pick them right back up. Oh, that's just a ho-ho, that's just a rah-rah. Baloney, you listen to that crap about the chiefs? This is God's word. Solomon fell apart. If he could come back, he would tell you, don't fall. If my daughter Victoria could come back, she'd tell you, don't fall into the evil of this world, and I'll kill you. And all of you sit there and get passive about things. Let's wake up a little bit. We've got work to do. I've got children and grandchildren, and many of you in this service do. Some of you are younger and having children. How are you going to raise them in this crazy world? Everything will be okay. I'm not saying don't trust the Lord with all your heart and lean into all understanding. In all that ways, acknowledge him. He'll direct the path. You wouldn't know what to do unless you got into the Word of God and knew that the verses were in there. And that you actually could believe them, reject the passivity of saying, oh, everything will be fine. And I've got to do something about my walk with the Lord. I got an hour in the Word, I need two. I got two in the Word, I need some fellowship. I need somebody to teach me. I need to get underneath. There is eight or nine classes being taught every morning around here. And some of you might need to go to the kids' class. That's okay. Pam is really good. She teaches me every week. <laughs> and you know that. She can teach you. Because she knows it's the real deal. Pam Snow is not passive about teaching our children. Absolutely not. Okay, i got five minutes. Here we go. Ecclesiastes 8. Here's our devotion in the Word of God. Just going to go through the devotion like I do every Sunday morning. We haven't had a group devotion since chapter 7. So here we go. I'm going to cover the first five verses. Highlight that. We've got about five or six highlights here. These are kind of notes as I've been studying and reading through this over the last week or two. Some things that, well, this is where the spirits landed me. First five verses, follow along. I like some of the questions here. I like good questions. 
Who is as the wise man, and who knoweth the interpretation of a thing? A man's wisdom maketh his face to shine, and the boldness of his face shall be changed. That's sweet when you see somebody that has wisdom of the Lord. They really do have this shiny look to them. Verse 2. I counsel thee to keep the king's commandment, and that in regard the o of the oath of God, be not hasty to go out of his sight, stand not in an evil thing, for he doeth whatsoever pleaseth him. Okay, what's he saying here? We'll follow verse 4 and 5. Where the word of a king is, there is power. Now, I know some of you really relate that to Jesus and all that, but just think, he's speaking of authority and he is a king. So we're going to speak of authority here in a moment. He says, and who may say unto him, what doest thou? Whoso keepeth the commandment shall feel no evil thing. A wise man's heart discerneth both time and judgment. A wise man discerns both time and judgment. I put up here on the screen this. The reality of the authorities. You say, well, of course the Bible says in Romans and it says in 1 Peter, and we just do whatever they say. In that. Whoa. You need to study the Bible. Because the Bible does teach us about the authorities in our lives, and they are there, and we are to submit to authority. Yes? Simple. But God's authority plan is very simple and clear from the Word of God, from the Old Testament, from the very beginning, to the New Covenant in the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, one of the greatest, if not the greatest, statements of submission to authority is the Lord Jesus Christ submitting to his Father's authority. But it was according to the perfect will of holy God. That's the way governments ought to be. Understand this. God set up government to reflect his laws. Not their own laws. My pastor knows this over here, Bobby. These guys know that. They weren't set up to do whatever they felt like doing. Study your Bible. Go into the Old Testament. And understand from Genesis all the way through to Malachi. The authority of government was put in, put in place to reflect God's rules, God's laws, God's edicts, God's commands, God's word. Now, that doesn't mean when they don't do it, okay, we're going to just pick it now and everybody's going to go up and we're going to start a riot against all the governments that don't do it. That's not what I said. Government can get perverted because man is sinful and wicked in his nature. And so you have to understand how you're going to position yourself. The reality is there's authority in your life. There's pastoral authority in people in churches. There's home authority and having, you know, some of you still have the pets running the house. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. How did a five-pound <laughs> get so much authority in my home? I need the chocolate lab back. That's authority, chocolate lab. Nom, 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 nom. See, that's God, right? Love of God. Love, 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 love. Nor in the Bible can you find that God would lick you. I, okay. But consider this. The reality of authorities, king, God, is how are you and I going to look at the simple submission to authority? It exists. And where we're disobedient to the king's commandment, we're disobedient to things. Yes, we're to obey. But to disobey orders would mean breaking his promise to him as the ruler if there are things put in place for the good because you need to study the scriptures. Those governments are put in place for you for the good. They're there for you. Not to get what you want, but for your parameters of protection and safety. All Solomon is saying is this, whoso keepeth the commandment shall Feel no evil thing. There's a protection in that. You drive down Adams Dairy Parkway at 75 at 2.30 in the afternoon, there's a good chance that you're going to have a car accident. And you're going to hurt somebody or somebody's going to hurt you. It's for your protection. That's a simple one. Someone can out, come to your house, knock on the door, and take your life out. Murder is wrong. And on and on it goes. Secondly, verse number six, seven, eight, here we go. Because to every purpose there is time and judgment, therefore the misery of man is great upon him. We've heard this before. For he knoweth not which shall be, for who can tell him when it shall be? There is no man that hath power over the spirit to retain the spirit, neither hath he power in the day of death. And there is no discharge in that war. 
neither shall wickedness deliver those that are given to it. Interesting that you mentioned that verse, and that's applicable in the way you're saying it, but really there's no discharge from the war that you battle in your flesh to die. You can't discharge yourself from dying. Is anybody in here planning on not dying? Hmm. You're thinking maybe rapture, aren't you? Okay, cheating. But see, there's something about this truth here. It says up on the screen, there's an inevitability in life over some things. And that's what Solomon's saying, inevitable things in life do remain. What do you mean? Every purpose, there is time and judgment. Therefore, the misery of man is great upon him. Why? Because certain things happen and you can't do anything about it. And it's kind of be miserable sometimes. <clears throat> Sickness is here. The plight of difficult things is here. The, the joy of raising children. Oh, it's so fun. No, it's a reality. And the time and judgment and the purpose is a real thing that has misery at times. But in that miserableness... There can be beautiful things. It's inevitable that in life certain things are going to happen. Knoweth not that which shall be, for who can tell him when it shall be? I know something's happened, but I don't know when. Who's going to tell? Only God knows. The beauty is that you and I can see what Solomon sees and says, the inevitability of things remains. Thirdly, verses 9 and 10. All this I have seen, Solomon says, and applied my heart unto every work that is under the sun. Done under the sun, there is a time wherein one man ruleth over another to his hurt. And so I saw the wicked buried, who had come and gone from the place of the holy. And they were forgotten in the city where they had so done. This is also vanity. A couple of simple things. Up on the screen it says this. Oppression is a real thing, and it has its reward. What do you mean? Oppression is wicked and wrong, and has its reward. What is it is? When people oppress others, Solomon's saying, guess what? And he knew this because he got it. The reward is that the hurt's coming to you, it says in verse number 9. Oh, I keep on getting oppressed. I keep on getting oppressed. I know that some people have been in a miserable, terrible relationship where they have oppression all the time. There are governments that oppress people and mankind for years, for centuries. You think from the place of... Nimrod all the way through to the pharaohs, Nebuchadnezzar, Darius, Caesars. Millions of people have been oppressed in one way or the other by bad rulers. Think about it. The Jews, they constantly, often suffered at the hands of foreign oppressors. Some of them they allowed in. Some of them they had no letting in. But it happened. Oppression, though, has its reward. What's the reward in verse number 9? There is a time wherein one man ruleth over another to his own hurt. Whoo! Is that every dog has his day? I don't know. I don't know if I can wait that long. I'd like to carry out the reverse hurt on them on my own volition. <laughs> Oppression does have its reward, Solomon's saying. And he's saying, guess what? In verse number 10, I saw the wicked buried who had come and gone from the place of the holy, and they were forgotten. <laughs> they got theirs. And it's all forgotten when somebody goes away that was an oppressor and they got their reward, which is the hurt to return to them. That reward could be that they're at the judgment, the white throne of judgment before God. Verses number 11 through 13, fear God despite inequity. I'll get there in a minute. Verse number 11 says this, because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. It continues. I know a lot of people grab that verse and say, hey, we just need to... Every time a kid messes up, just whack him on the bottom. That's not what it says. Every time a kid's on a line, you need to just punish him. Whoa, 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 whoa. We're talking about an offense in the line of the law and breaking of the law in a scenario which says a sentence, not just the judgment, but now the sentence against evil, it's not executed speedily. You say, well, I need to do something about it within an appropriate amount of minutes or hours or a day or two so that there is a retribution or at least if you want to extend grace and mercy like God did in, the, in David's life, it's done speedily. It's done with a purpose. It's not passively dealt with. 
Verse number 12 and 13 say, Though a sinner do evil in a hundred, day, hundred times, and his days be prolonged, yet surely I know that it shall be well with them that fear God, which fear before him. But it shall not be well with the wicked, neither shall he prolong his days, which are as a shadow, because he feareth not before God. What does it say up on the screen? Fear God despite inequity. We've talked about fear God. He brings it up a lot at the end of Ecclesiastes. He talks about, again, fear God and keep his commandments. This is the whole duty of man. Fear God is a really big thing. Amidst all the stuff that's going on, you and I personally, before God, should not be so passive that we go, oh, since he gave somebody a Pasadena and somebody a, a kick in a pass and whatever happened, I can just, okay, God, I'm, I'm going to be free from anything that's going to happen. Listen. There is an inequity that goes on in your life. I didn't say iniquity, inequity. There's things that just don't seem e equal. How did he get away? How does she do this? How? Think about it in families. Any of you that have more than one child? How did he get away with that? And every time I do it, I get in trouble. He's your favorite. There's inequity. Well, how are we going to do personally before God? Don't be passive about it and try to do this right here. Before God, I need to be in a place of fear. Because that person over their whole life that does not fear God, their end is not going to be a good one. Their end is going to be a rough one, as it says there in verse number 13. That it shall not be well with the wicked, neither shall he prolong his days, which are as a shadow, because he feareth not before God. Fear God, everyone. Don't be passive about that. Reject the passivity there. Verses 14 and 15. There is a vanity which is done upon the earth, that there is be just men, unto whom it happeneth according to the work of the wicked. Again, there be wicked men to whom it happeneth according to the work of the righteous. I said this is also vanity. Rain falls on the just and the unjust, right? We know this principle. Solomon's brought it up before. How in the world do people that are awful people, wicked people, evil people, they, they, they get away with everything? Well, so you think. How about so many righteous people, godly people, they live a good life, and yet they suffer so terrible. They've gone through so many things. You and I don't know. The old phrase has always been, why wouldn't God just stop all the wars in this world? Did God start them? It's amazing how we want God to clean up something that we started. I'm good like that. I, I can do that. Verse number 15, it says, Then I commended mirth. Here's the solution. <laughs> just get drunk. <laughs> because a man hath no better thing under the sun than to eat and to drink and to be merry for that shall abide with him of his labor of his days of his life, which God giveth him under the sun. By the way, if somebody's watching this recording, they go, oh, just get drunk, and then they shut it off. I'm going, oh my gosh, I'm in trouble. I'll have to resign next week. That's not what I said. This is Solomon's improper or incorrect conclusion. Well, because things don't make any sense, God's sense, good sense, things don't make any sense. They, they don't make any sense. Righteous people are suffering. Wicked people are getting by. You know what the answer is? Let's party. What? Ah, just kick it down the road and become passive about everything. And there's nothing you can do about it. Ah, eat, drink, and be merry. Where do you think, again, that this stuff comes from? Carpe diem. Where does all this stuff come from? It comes from twisting God's word to fit man's flesh. It's amazing how man and his activity and his actions and sin can become so non-passive. And when it comes to these kind of things, God says, hey, listen, don't just do the sin stuff or let the sin go or just say, okay, because things don't make any sense to you, that gives you permission to sin. You can become passive in, a, in guarding your heart. You wonder, Solomon just kept on letting things get worse and worse and worse in his life. We still don't know how in the world did he get to the place where he had all those, would have one or two or three, well, we know how we are. We're obsessed with sometimes feeding the flesh. Lastly, verse number 16 and 17. When I applied my heart to know wisdom and to see the business that is done upon the earth, for also there is that neither day nor night seeth sleep with his eyes. Someone that just keeps on 
keeps on. Verse number 17. Then I beheld all the work of God. I love that statement. I beheld the work of God that a man cannot find. They just can't find out the work that is done under the sun. (laughs) Because though a man labor to seek it out, yet he shall not find it. Yea, farther, though a wise man think to know it, yet shall he not be able to find it. I have listened to people say, I'm just going to keep on finding it all out. It's a hopeless pursuit to know it all. I mentioned this a few weeks ago. Some of you think that you're Mr. Bowwinkle. You know, anybody know who Bowwinkle is? Bowwinkle's so cool. You don't know Bowwinkle and Rocket J. Squirrel? Yeah, you guys better look him up. Any of you were born in the century that I was born in. He was Mr. Know-it-all. He'd walk out on the stage, ah, Mr. Know-it-all. Nothing up my sleeve, presto. Bullwinkle was Mr. Know-it-all. Well, he is a cartoon moose. (laughs) That's how we get when we think we know it all before God and how we can know it all with God. I said to this a few weeks ago, God's Mr. Know-it-all. To know the things that you need to know in the words awesome, keep after it. Oh, Brownie said, be passive about knowledge since you can't know anything about it. Ha, I'm not going to study the Bible anymore. He just gave me permission. No, I didn't. It's a hopeless pursuit to know all. But you can know the Lord, the mind of Christ. We have the mind of Christ. There's riches in that beautiful word. There's riches in his words that he wrote. It's his love letter to us. He has so much to have us know, understand, and bring wisdom. But don't get to a place where you say, ah, since that's what Solomon said, I'm just going to be passive. We need to reject passivity. Here's your last couple of minutes then. When you think of that, reject passivity. How does it come back? We've been using Solomon a little bit, picking on him a little bit. I'm not picking on him really. I I just, he's our illustration. He's in the word of God. It's the Holy Spirit leading us, right? So go to 1 Kings 10, a few verses. We finish right here. I'm just going to give you two things, and we're going to relate it to Solomon and what he was looking like there. I used used, uh, 1 Kings 9 last time and 8, and we've had some good things out of Just a small accounting, but there's more about Solomon. We could study him deeply. This study is about search for purpose and everything. How in the world did Solomon get to this point? How in the world did you get to this point? How in the world did some of us get drawn? Because we're passive about the things of God, and we're active about the things of our flesh. We're conflicted. I love everybody to love me. I'm going to work the rest of my life on that. Because that's the command, right? No, I just twisted it a little, didn't I? I took love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love thy neighbor as thyself. Not just love thy neighbor. Love thy neighbor as thyself because I love myself and I want everybody to love. So I flip the commands around a little bit so that I can get everybody to love me. Because I love to be loved. I could sing that song right now, but we're not going to do that, okay? We're going to get into the Word of God. Because we love that part. But that's not what the command says. What am I conveying to you very simply? Pastoral, I want you to get these two things, put them in your pocket, use them this week maybe, and they, go re- they do bring us back to 1 Kings chapter number 10. Let me go ahead and get there real quick. I like these little things. Don't you love these things in your Bible? If you don't have any of these, go get like 10 of them. Then you can put your Bible wherever you want. Okay, here we go. I'll just use little sticky notes. First thing here I want you to grab. Reject passivity. Settling for man's pursuit of our wisdom only weakens our active pursuit of God's wisdom in his word. Write that down. Chew on that a little bit. Stare at it a little bit. Settling for man's pursuit of our wisdom only weakens our active pursuit of God's wisdom in his word. We need to reject passivity when it comes to the wisdom that we have to this point, how it 
gets in our minds that, hey, I'll grab some more wisdom, grab some more wisdom, and stand up before people. People will love me for my wisdom. And all of a sudden, people come to me for all the answers. People love me because I'm so wisdom-filled. People love me because I'm the best teacher of the Bible. Watch out. I love to listen to this blog, and I love to listen to this preacher, and this guy, and that guy. After a while, you're doing exactly what these people did in 1 Kings chapter number 10. Where are you coming from, pastor? Watch it. It's very simple. Verses 24 down through the end of the chapter. I'm going to grab verse 23 because I want you to know that the Bible said it, not me, once again. So King Solomon exceeded all the kings of the earth for riches and for wisdom. I did not tell you off of my own thinking because I met Solomon one day and lived in his time that I knew he was that guy. The Bible says Solomon exceeded all the kings of the earth for riches and for wisdom. We looked at this in our introduction months ago. We continue. In light of that, watch what happens in verse 24. Ugh. And all the earth sought Solomon. It doesn't say all the earth sought God. Sought Solomon. To do what? To hear his wisdom, which God had put in his heart. And then it gets really bad in the next few verses. We'll reiterate it as we read it. Not really reiterate it, we're just revisiting it because it's been so many months. But consider this. It's about to give you an accounting of a man who went against the law of God when it comes to a king having possessions. He cannot have all that he is having. But he's going after it. He can't have the chariots and the horses and the, and the gold and the silver. He is not to have all of this. And yet, he does. Verse 24 tells you what happened to this man. Go back one slide, please, and let me remind you of this. When you settle for man's pursuit of our wit, listen. Oh, I need to get the wisdom so everybody will just come to me. It only weakens your active pursuit of God's wisdom in his word. Why do you really want people to be around you? Solomon figured out something pretty good. Everybody came to seek out Solomon. And it was what God gave him in his heart that gave him the recognition and all the monies. Where did God ever get any credit here? None. Because he became passive. We needed to reject that passivity when it comes to why we get the wisdom, how we get the wisdom, what we're after. Verse 25, they brought every man present, vessels, silver, gold, garments, armor, spices, <coughs> excuse me, horses, mules, a rate year by year. They just kept on giving it every year. Solomon gathered together chariots, horsemen, had 1,400 chariots, 12,000 horsemen. My gosh, this guy had everything. He already was the richest, and they kept on giving it to him. Why? Because they sought him for what? His wisdom that he had. They sought Solomon and not God. Why didn't he just say, keep your stuff? Why don't you go after God? Because he was breaking all the commandments and all the laws of God for a king. It says in verse 28 and 29, Solomon had horses brought out of Egypt, linen yarn, oh, he had everything chariot came up in verse number 29 like watch this out of egypt for 600 shekels of silver a house for 150 and so for the kings of the hittites the kings of syria and they bring them out by their means it never ever stops when man's worship becomes of man and not man's worship point to god reject the passivity that you are sitting in when it comes to being like Solomon and saying, oh, I'm so glad I had this wonderful life in the Lord and everybody wants to hear me teach and preach and disciple. Be careful that you do not pursue wisdom because man's pursuit of our wisdom to say, I want your wisdom, I want your wisdom. I want to be as smart as that man. Woo! That's a conflict. I want to be as wise as God would allow me. And then the second piece here, and we're done. Reject passivity. Settling for the world's pursuit of love only weakens our active pursuit of God's love 
in his commands. Leave it right up there. I'm finishing up right here. Settling for the world's pursuit of love only weakens our active pursuit of God's love and his commands. He's going to leave that right up there as I read. Verse 1, chapter 11. But King Solomon loved many strange women. It doesn't say he liked them or they stopped by for a visit. He loved them. Please do not lightly, passively just kind of go over that. He loved them. It continues. Together with the daughter of Pharaoh, woman of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Zidonites, and the Hittites. Continues. Verse 2. I told you we get to verse number 1, 2, and 3 of 11 after we opened with 4 and 5 and 6. Of the nations concerning which the Lord has said unto the children of Israel, ye shall not go unto them. Neither shall they come into you, for surely they will turn your heart after God's. What does it say here? Solomon claved unto those in love. Maybe you'll catch this real quick. I love you, but I'm not in love with you. You just define yourself as someone that's like Solomon. In love. He had them in love. The Bible says to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's the first. The second is to love thy neighbor as thyself. I mentioned it earlier, Jesus Christ, as we know in John's gospel, says, I give you another commandment. I give you a new commandment to love and lay down your life as I did. That's that love. You see, the pursuit of love in the world, in the world's love, it only weakens our active pursuit of God's love and his commands. When I pursue his love, then it doesn't get to a point in verse number three where his wives turned away his heart because he had them in love. He loved them and he was in love. Whoa. That tells you something about what we're drawn to. So we end up becoming passive about the love of God and the way we're to love and we become active in the wrong kind of love. I leave you with this. Passivity only leads to the acceptance of excuses with myself and from other people. Excuses are nice. We all have them. Anybody have any excuses? I'm the only one in the room. If you go to Luke 14, you'll find some good ones. <clears throat> As Jesus talks about the invitation to the supper. When I accept excuses in a way that's okay, people are going to have them. But passivity is what leads to the acceptance of things. So here's your question to finish out. What will we do to reverse our passivity over people? Hang on now. Like a Solomon. Like someone you know. Right now, I want you to think about someone over people who are actively running from the things of God. Because maybe the person you're thinking about right now is you. Church, what are we going to do to reverse our passivity over people who are actively running from the things of God? We're not to show up at their door and threaten them. We're to be available for them. We're to say, hey, I'd come alongside of you with the word and with the spirit of God, and we're not going to be passive about our walk with the Lord anymore. We are going to reject passivity about the things of God together. We're going to be active over the things of God which is totally contrary to where Solomon was. Please bow your heads for a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, as we conclude in our prayer, I know we've been in the word for a while. I thank you for the spirit of God at work right now in the name of Jesus. And I thank you for the word of God doing its work. It does not return void. I pray very simple prayer this morning in our invitation as the music plays and as we just have a... Uh, <clears throat> An attitude of prayer right now. That God, whatever you're speaking to every single person here, 
that God, they will hear you. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. I pray you'd open up your will, your way, your truth for so many. And this morning, God, this time of prayer and invitation will be profitable to you. In Jesus' name, please stand.